Excellent. Okay, Christopher Luxon, thank you so much for sitting down with Sky News Australia. Great to be with you. I suppose there are around 700,000 Kiwis that live in Australia. That's around 17% of New Zealand's population. So for those who may not know, <laughs> who is Christopher Luxon and why do you want the top job? Well, look, first thing I'd say, if we couldn't be Kiwis, we'd probably be Aussies. Uh, and you're right, a big number of us have actually lived and spent a lot of time in Australia, myself included. I was there for five years and my son was born there and uh, absolutely loved the place too. So, um, but we won't let too many people know that. Uh, but no, look, I mean, my background's, you know, regular Kiwi upbringing. I had young parents. Um, they had left school at 15 and 16. Uh, I was the first person in my family to go to university. I went to the University of Canterbury. Did a four-year Masters in Commerce and Business Administration and, and, and at the end of that joined a company called Unilever and Unilever was one of the big global packaged goods companies in the world and that's what then I spent 16 of my 18 years then living and working overseas in Sydney and London and Chicago and Toronto and New York. So, um, so it was a great way for me to go see the world and then I came back home to New Zealand to um, run Air New Zealand as the CEO of Air New Zealand. And obviously, again, got more involved with both New Zealand and Australia at that point. We had quite a large business uh, emanating in Australia. And at that time, we also owned Virgin Australia uh, as well in, in, in Australia. So I spent a lot of time there as well. And then uh, in the, the last two years, I've come into politics. And that's partly because I think, frankly, this is the best country on planet Earth. Um, we've got endless amounts of potential. We've got some big problems that we've got to go solve. And I wanted to go, go to work on those things. I suppose in the scheme of things, uh particularly in comparison to your challenger, Prime Minister Chris Hipkins, you're quite new to politics and you've not been around for as long as he has. Uh, you were member for Botany in 2020 and then elected National Party leader in 2021. Does that put you at a disadvantage for the election? I think it's actually a real advantage. You know, I'm not a career politician. You know, I haven't been here 20 years and I actually think that's a really good thing. I think of the challenges that New Zealand has at the moment require some real world leadership and actually someone who's used to getting things done and that's really what a lot of my career has been about is you know getting companies that were good to be great and, and making sure that we can get things turned around sorted and, and moving forward and I think a lot of that skill set frankly for me feels very transferable into the job that I aspire to have and so and into political life um, so that's that's why I think it's actually really appropriate and really important. It doesn't mean that I, you know, I've had learned a lot over the last two years. It means, um, you know, as I said, I'm not a career politician, but I think that experience is really useful. There were a lot of controversies in the National Party, particularly in the last couple of years. I suppose your caucus would look at you as someone of a John Key figure. How, what do you make of that? Well, look, I think when you look through the history of any political party, you know, you have periods of tremendous success. Um, you know, we had that in the National Party here in New Zealand with... John Key, who I thought was an outstanding Prime Minister, and Bill English as well. And then we obviously were out of government for a period of time and going through a massive rebuilding phase. Uh, and with that came a whole bunch of drama at different times. Uh, and you know, my job has been to turn the party around, uh, to make it competitive, uh, and actually then to take it to the government, and then ultimately to win government and to turn the country around. Um, again, the same, my situation I felt was actually more similar to, say, David Cameron and the UK Conservatives, who had gone through a a period of, of great success with the Conservatives. Uh, a Labour Party had come in with, with good leadership uh, and then actually how do you rebuild that party, uh, modernise the party, make it relevant, make it competitive contemporary and that's really been the work that I've been going through in the last, last year and a bit. Uh, so we've seen the polling at the end of last year where Jacinda Ardern, former Prime Minister and the Labour Party were at their worst ever ratings. We saw at the beginning of this year that Chris Hipkins turned that around a little bit he is known as Mr Fixit. Do you think that Chris Hipkins is what the Labour Party really needs to bring it through the election? Look, I mean, I, I really, I don't see him as Mr Fixit at all, you know, it, which was probably not surprising to you. You know, from my perspective, he's a, it's a new leader, but it's the same old Labour. You know, he was one of the three with Grant Robertson, Jacinda Ardern, that were the inner sanctum of the Labour Party over the last five and a half years. And frankly, it's been a really disappointing government in the sense of, our economy's going backwards, our crime is rising, we've still got housing and infrastructure challenges, we've got major challenges with education and our healthcare system's falling apart. And so we've got some real issues that we have to deal with. And it's a government that's focused on a lot of activity, but very poor achievement. And in my world, those are two very different concepts. And so outcomes 
is what I'm very fixated on, and actually fun fundamentally he has been unable to deliver that, and so has this government. So it's been a very unusual start to life here in New Zealand, as you're aware. Uh, we've had tremendous, uh, you know, we've had a major weather event with Cyclone Gabriel. Uh, we've had a change in Prime Minister, uh, and of course, you know, it's just been a, a really odd start to the year. Uh, but it's been good to get back into Parliament. Here we are in March, and we've had uh, two question times, I think, with the Prime Minister uh, at the beginning of the year uh, so far only, uh, and that's we're in the middle of March. So it's um, so it's good to get back in the rhythm and get back into it again. But the issues remain the same. How do you reduce the cost of living? How do you raise incomes for all? How do you invest in resilient infrastructure? How do we restore law and order? And how do we deliver better health and education? And that's what this election is going to be about. You say that it's a different leader but the same party, but as soon as Chris Hipkins came to be party leader and prime minister, he backtracked on a lot of policies that didn't have a lot of favour with New Zealanders. So doesn't that mean that he's, he's trying to differentiate himself from what he's well, well, yes and no. I mean, there was one big policy that was the only one that really got, you know, really killed, which was the merger of TV and Z and Radio New Zealand, which was an insane idea from the very beginning. And I think anyone and everyone in this country was saying that's just the dumbest thing that we've seen sort of happen. Uh, so that, you know, that, that has been killed. But in many cases, a lot of what he did was actually just defer a few things across until after the election. You know, we're still waiting to see what his position is on co-governance. We're still waiting to see what his position is on the Labor's three water reforms. Uh, we haven't got, you know, so we, I want to see the detail and actually see, you can talk the language, but can you actually get it done and get it delivered? You've actually um, perhaps led the charge with naming some policies already. And we, we heard from the Prime Minister on Monday at the post-cab presser saying that he wasn't going to start releasing details about policy until after the budget. Does that put you at an advantage for the election? Do you think it's, it's important to get ahead of it when there is a cost of living crisis and New Zealand is essentially facing a recession? Well, look, I mean, the way that I've thought about it as the leader is, look, last year was all about us making the case, getting our own house in order and making sure we were competitive and working together as a team and how I get the best out of the 34 MPs that we have in the National Party. Um, then it's been really about, you know, we've opposed the government and, and been really clear as the leader of the opposition and our democracy, it's a key responsibility to hold the government to account but this year in my mind is actually people see us as an alternative government in waiting so it's my responsibility to give them a feel for what they're going to get and as a result talking about policy which we've been working on for the last six to nine months and actually you know uh, bringing that to, to into the public square and in for a good debate is actually really important so this year you've seen us already talk about what we would do around local water done well and what's our investment model that we think is the right thing to deliver three waters which in New Zealand means drinking water storm water wastewater uh, and then you would have seen on the weekend our view which is we think there's a tremendous amount of wasted government spending by this government and we're taking a proportion of that and we're giving it straight back to low and middle income families, 130,000 families through a childcare tax rebate and we think that's a much better use of that money. So yeah, we want to be able to talk about our ideas and our policies. Um, I think it's important that New Zealand people want to hear from us about what we're going to do, not just attack the government. Thinking outside the domestic sphere of New Zealand and putting New Zealand on a world on the, on the world spectrum, mm. that was really Jacinda Ardern's intention, was that she wanted New Zealand to be known. Did she achieve that well enough and did COVID-19 or the government's response to COVID-19 hinder them a little? Look, I think, you know, the, the records, I think the, the two things, I, as I said at the time when Jacinda Ardern resigned, was that, you know, I was actually uh, in Christchurch pretty quickly and I, you know, I met with her a couple of times down there. Um, I thought she did a very good job handling the Christchurch massacre and actually made us all feel very proud. I think on the other level, uh, you know, she did a fairly good job of making sure that New Zealand maintained its ability to punch above our weight globally. And we've had previous Prime Ministers, I think, that have done a good job in that space as well. Um, and so, you know, those are the things that I think, you know, I'd give her credit for. You know, New Zealand has huge opportunity ahead of it because we sit bang smack in the middle of the Pacific uh, and, you know, there is massive opportunities as we've seen with the rapidly rising middle classes in the Americas, Asia, obviously we've got Australia close by as well. Um, and we've seen a huge shift of power culturally, economically from the Atlantic into the Pacific. So it's a hugely exciting time for both Australia and New Zealand, I'd put it to you, given that if we were to go off and design a new country or set of two new countries, where would we put them? We'd probably put them bang smack in the world where Australia and New Zealand actually are to do well in the world. Um, we'd make sure that we have a good uh, rule of law and we'd make sure we have a good functioning democracy. And um, so we've got a lot of things going well for us, I think, as a country. The question is, over the COVID period, there's no doubt about it, we became much more insular. I think we became much more 
inward-looking, uh, much more negative, um, um, and as a result, we lost a huge amount of confidence, I think, aspiration, ambition, and positivity, and, and I want to bring that back to New Zealand because we have a fantastic future, but we just have to go to work now and sort our problems out and go realise all the potential that we've got. There's been a lot of reference to New Zealand as uh, a country that has woke policies. Do you think that New Zealand is a woke country? Uh, I'm not sure whether that's helpful or unhelpful and I try and sort of stay away from labels frankly because all I want to know is, is New Zealand going forwards. You know, that's what I'm invested in and what I, why I've come to do this job because I think we've just got lots of potential but I see that we have major problems that we haven't faced up to or dealt to. Um, I think there is a, you know, some values that we want to call people to, personal responsibility. If you work incredibly hard, you deserve to be able to get ahead. Um, you should be able to be able to raise your families in a safe environment and know that you're supported. You should be able to have access to those public services when you need them. Um, so I think you know, we've got a, a great country. I think you know, there's no doubt about it. It's become much more internal, um, wet, uh, negative, I think, uh, over the last few years as a function of the government's policies. But I want us to rediscover that external orientation, that positivity, to be able to go out in the world and, and do so with great confidence. I think a lot of that woke, that chat about woke policy might have come from the fact that Labor's been accused of being soft on crime. Yeah. And we know that National has policy of restoring law and order. I think if we, if we look back, I'll, I'll even rattle some statistics, 80% of RAM raids reported in 2022 were from people under the age of 18. Mm. There were more than 500 incidents. It's a six-fold increase from four years ago. Yeah. So Chris Hipkins was the police minister under Jacinda Ardern's government, and he believed that the tough-on-crime rhetoric was simply rhetoric that didn't work. Do you agree with that? Was he right? No. I mean, we have had a government that's been totally, utterly soft on crime. And, you know, the first primary responsibility I think a government has to its citizens is to make sure that they feel safe in their homes and their, in, their, in their businesses and in their community. And that is the reality in New Zealand. Things have got increasingly unsafe. The only target the government has had has had a reduction in the prison population. You know, I think that they wanted 30% reduction, they're running at about 26%. That would be lovely and perfectly fine and reasonable if we had a 30% reduction in crime. But we've got violent crime up over 31%. We've had a 500% growth, a 50% growth in gang membership, um, and we've had a 500% growth in, in ram raids here in New Zealand, which is a completely new phenomenon for us. So you know, people are not feeling safe, and you know, we look at particularly if I look at some of the policy that we saw around gangs in Australia, that I think has been really effective, whether it's been WA or whether it's been some of the work in New South Wales and, and even Queensland. You know, we want to be able to say, look, we're going to ban gang patches in public places. We are going to have a dedicated gang unit. We're going to make sure that we have you know, warrantless search powers for illegal you know, guns. We need to be really clear about that because gang membership is running, I think, just over 8,200 in New Zealand. We've got just over 10,000 police officers. And in some of our regions, we'll have more gang members and we'll have police officers by the end of the year. So, you know, those are really real issues. Um, we do have an issue with young people and serious youth offenders, as you'll be aware of with a ram raid that's been happening every 15 hours in this country. And so we've said, no, I'm sorry, we are going to have serious consequences for those serious repeat youth offenders. And we are also going to use community organisations and our youth military academies to actually say, we're going to make powerful targeted intervention in those young people's lives because we care about them, we love them, but we actually have to make sure we get their life back on track again. And actually we think you know, youth military academies is a good way for us to be able to do that in conjunction with community organisations, to be able to take them out of bad environments, to get them uh, on the right track and actually going back out into the world and being very positive and making that good contribution. So for the National Party, is it about preventing crime or responding to crime? Well, there's two, you know, we've, we need to be tough on crime and famously said tough on the causes of crime. And, you know, and so the tough on crime thing is we have to say, I'm sorry, but we are on the side of victims here, uh, not on the side of offenders. And we need to be able to call people to personal responsibility. There is rights and responsibilities to being a Kiwi uh, to each other, uh, to each other's citizens, but also to the country. And you can't just take all the rights and not have the responsibilities. And so we need to get that part of it straight and we need to have a little straight talk conversation around that, which is what we've been talking about. But on the other hand, we have to get to the root causes of why does this happen in, in our society. And that's where our thinking around social investment, which is this, this thinking that you know, former Prime Minister Bill English started to think about and develop. We really want to bring that to life. 
which are saying, look, we see amazing work happening in a number of community organisations who can really identify troubled families, troubled young people. And so we want to take money out of central government and get it power up those community organisations who are doing such great work to deliver better social outcomes. And we want to, to get outcomes is what we're about to do in this government. And so we think many times the community organisations can do a much, much better job than what has happened in this government, everything being centralised and controlled from Wellington. So, you know, for us, it's a, you've, got to work, you've got to set really clear standards. This is the deal we have with each other in New Zealand, and there are rights and responsibilities, and therefore there are consequences that need to be really clearly understood and enforced. And at the same hand, there's long-term work for us to do to say, as a party that believes in an equality of opportunity, that we don't believe in an equality of outcome, but we do believe that five-year-olds in this country should be able to set off in their life with an equal shot at their version of the Kiwi dream, whatever that may mean. Been. We have to work hard to make sure we get some of those kids to the start line, and that means investing in education, making powerful targeted interventions, um, dealing with some of the issues around inequality that we see that causes some of these issues. So, you know, that's hard work, um, but we think partnering up with community organisations to do that work to deliver outcomes is important. How do you feel about the 501 deportees policy? Well, look, I mean, we're with the government. I mean, it's, a, it's not a political party position. I mean, we just feel it's pretty unfair that people who have had no connection essentially to New Zealand are uh, obviously deported to New Zealand. We appreciate that each country has its own uh, sovereign you know, uh, rules and, and ability to make its own independent decisions. But you know, from, from given the closeness of our relationship, I think you know, we're very supportive of what has been communicated uh, by, by, the, by this, this government. Our position will be very, very similar. Our issue is that here in New Zealand, gangs have got completely, utterly out of control. And um, we need to be really tough and send that message back to say this is unacceptable. I want to talk a little bit about co-governance. Mm. Australia at the moment is, uh, well, our Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is pushing for a vote, a uh, voice to Parliament uh, to go to referendum, uh, essentially giving a voice for Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander Australians to Parliament to make sure that they are there is an improved representation in our own government. There are suggestions that New Zealand's attempt at, go, at co-governance will premise what could happen to the voice. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it's a word that has been has changed its meaning in New Zealand in recent years, and the government hasn't been straight up about it, and that's been my frustration, which is. If you're going to have a constitutional change, you actually take, make your case and you take it to the New Zealand people and you spend your political capital and you take them with you on it. And we had some good examples in New Zealand where our version was, hey listen, we had a treaty between Māori and between the Crown, uh, that was in 1840. Uh, that, the Crown didn't hold up to its obligations uh, in, 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 in very obvious moments. Uh, and as a result, we wanted to right that wrong as best we could, as imperfectly as we could, through what we called treaty settlements which was actually doing settlements with each individual treaty or iwi as we call them throughout New Zealand uh, to actually say, you know, this gives you a, then a, 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 firstly an apology, uh, then actually a, a financial uh, pathway to be able to make a contribution to New Zealand. Now that, that was quite a bold step that happened in the mid-90s. And the Prime Minister at the time was a National Party, Prime Minister uh, Jim Bolger uh, and uh, Sir, D Sir Douglas Graham was his uh, Treaty Negotiations Minister. Well, they made the case to the New Zealand people as to why we thought that was a good thing. And under successive governments, whether they were National or Labour, we all said as New Zealanders, yep, we are on board with that. And there will be some that said, no, we should never have done it, and there will be others that say it was never enough. Um, but the point was we took the country with us on that. On co-governance, that hasn't been the case. And in New Zealand, you know, we've always understood co-governance to mean, look, when we're doing those treaty settlements, in the context of treaty settlements, Māori are working on the management, uh, joint management often with local district councils uh, with respect to natural resources in the context of treaty settlements. You know, that's been a very positive thing, actually, to have Māori voice around how to manage natural uh, geographies and natural resources has been, been very positive, I think, for New Zealand by and large. But what we started to hear was this, that, that, and that was how we had understood that word co-governance. But then it was actually delivered as we'll have two healthcare systems, uh, you know, as we've seen with Māori Health Authority and, and, and Health New Zealand. Uh, well, actually, no, we are one country. We have one public service system. It targets and supports people on the basis of need, not ethnicity. Uh, and we can meet those needs through the deploying community organisations, whether they're Māori or um, you know, other community housing providers or whatever it may need to be. But we're all equal under the law, one person, one vote. And so that's, that's, the, that's our, been, been our position and what we've articulated obviously over the last year. And is that, I mean, you've previously called co-governance immature and divisive. 
obviously not because you're against sharing power between Māori and the Crown, but because of the reasons you just stipulated. Well, we're, we're a party that's about localism and devolution. We believe those closest to the problems are often best left to solve the problems. So when you have local Māori tribes, uh, or iwi as we call them here in New Zealand, working with their local district councils or regional councils on the management of local natural resources, rivers, bushland, farmland, you know, a whole bunch of things, is actually a really good thing. It's been a very positive construct for New Zealand. But what this was, was then taking a, a and out of it was that that was the context, and now putting it into something new and different, which was really implying we're going to have two systems and two systems for the delivery of public services, and and we are one country. We are we have one system and we have one public service system. It can have innovation within it, leveraging community organisations to meet people's needs, but we do that on the basis of needs, not ethnicity. Um, and as I said, all one person, one vote, uh, equal under the law. So does that mean you're against co-governance? Yes, yeah, so it, well, as it's been defined by this government, uh, because it, again, it hasn't been upfront with the New Zealand people about what it's trying to do. So what would National do for co-governance then? Well, we, we, we've, we've been supportive of what we call the co-management arrangements in the context of treaty settlements, uh, and that's been a well-established um, you know, pathway in New Zealand, and it's actually been, by and large, incredibly positive and constructive. Uh, but what we are not up for, and what we've ruled out very clearly, is there'll be no co-governance of public services. Uh, we think that a government delivers for all New Zealanders, irrespective of their ethnicity, uh, and um, as a result, we, we meet their needs on the basis, on the basis of needs not ethnicity and so we'll have one 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 public service uh, and um, we may deliver that through different organizations but that's the idea is there anything that Australia could learn from New Zealand's attempts at, at trying to reconcile their indigenous with the crown yeah look I think it's important I mean um, you know, having lived in Australia and I'm, I'm not an expert and I don't want to you know uh, be presumptuous about my read of the Australian situation but you know it's been you know, we, we have pride in New Zealand about our, our strong bicultural foundations to our country and I think you know, we should be incredibly proud about it and I think the way that we have uniquely uh, worked together with all the steps forward and the steps backward and the investment in each other has actually been a good thing. You know, New Zealand is a much more tolerant uh, place uh, as a consequence of that experience over the last, you know, um, since 1840 really. And so I think that's something we all Kiwis feel incredibly proud about. But, um, you know, and so I think, you know, it's been good to see in Australia, for example, call to country. You know, you never used to see that at sporting events. I know it's a small thing, but it's actually just an acknowledgement that I think is entirely appropriate. And, um, and so I think some of those movements have been positive. It's an interesting point that you just raised because when I arrived in New Zealand, I couldn't believe how everyone was speaking today or Māori. It was just so, so normal. And the idea of changing New Zealand's name to Aotearoa New Zealand, is that something that you agree with? They should change the name? Look, I, I personally don't. I mean, from a point of, my point of view is that, you know, having lived and worked overseas, it's very difficult for New Zealand as a country, as a brand to be well understood in a world of 8 billion people and 195 other countries. Just so from a, from that point of view, I think you know New Zealand is the name of the country. But you know, should we should New Zealanders feel they want to change it? That's something you take to them for a referendum. So you know, I personally prefer New Zealand uh, as what I tend to use. Um, but you know, if if it was to be something, it would have to go to the New Zealand people for a proper decision on it. And just finally, ahead of the election, it's obviously in October. Everybody is very anxious about it. But what or, or excited or about excited it. about <laughs> it? That's exactly it. But what kind of a state is New Zealand in now, and where does it need to be? Yeah, look, I think we're really facing the crossroads. You know, we have had a period of of you know we've got first world country expectations, but the reality is we're dealing with high inflation, high interest rates, possible recession, and rising unemployment economically. And the government has really failed to deal with you know, economic management in a positive way. And it's different because you know, New Zealand is a small country, Australia is a medium size, the US is a large one. And when you're a small country and actually going to some turbulent seas as we look at the global outlook, you actually need to be even have stronger economic management because you get smacked around a lot more uh, by virtue of the size of your economy and, and, and the size of your boat in that ocean. Um, so we've got some real challenges there. We've got some real issues around education. That's probably the most alarming thing for me to confront since coming here uh, to Parliament, has been realising we only have 46% of our kids going to school regularly. We have 100,000 kids chronically absent from school. 
Um, you know, we have had, I think, close to 10,000 kids disenrolled from school. And so they're, they're not in schooling. And then the, you know, the other challenge is that if they're not attending, well, then the issue is that we're actually not teaching the basics very well. So when you look at our performance on real basics of maths, reading, and uh, writing, uh, and then let alone science, you know, we, our standards globally have slipped tremendously. And that's really alarming because one of the ways we will generate more wealth is by having a, a world-class education system where our people can actually access higher paying jobs by selling you know, more premium products and services. And so it's an economic crisis in the future, but it's also really a social and a moral failure, I think, as well. So you know, education has some challenges. You will have seen in our healthcare system here, every single health outcome has gone backwards over the last six years. And so access time to emergency wait times, access times to see first surgeries, uh, first specialist appointments, all of that has just blown out tremendously. So, you know, and we've got challenges around our housing are still really expensive and actually how we can unlock that. Yet we live in a country the size of Great Britain and Japan with plenty of land and five million people. Uh, so so we, we have a lot of convoluted bureaucracy in, in the way central and local government works. That just means we don't build houses. Uh, quickly enough or fast enough. Um, we've got to invest in some you know, really serious infrastructure that makes us connect well to the world, but to each other. So there's some really big challenges that we've really got to get to work on to make sure that this country can realise those expectations that we have. You, know, you, you have to earn your right to be a first world country. It's not just automatically given to you. And I think you know, we're at that point Whereas, um, we can, are we going to really step up and want to realise all that great potential, endless potential that we have? Because we have amazing people, you know, we have incredibly innovative, talented, resilient, de determined Kiwis. You know, we battle and we, we punch above our weight everywhere around the world. And so we've got all that talent, but we've really got to make sure that um, people want to invest it here in New Zealand. That's perfect. Thank you very much, Christopher Luxon, for sitting down with us. Great to be with you.